to the annual general meeting. Because they're basically... Man, I played almost every sport under the sun. Yeah, um, but did you ever join the club? Like, be mm. on the committee? Oh, the back end of things? Yeah, you know? Nah. Be in the management committee? No, no, no. So, Julie and I haven't either in all our life. And that's what's happening. There. <clears throat> we're sitting there and they said, oh, we run every year a gem show. Yeah. So Julie and I decided... So they said, oh, we don't have anyone to run it next year. And we'd help them this year just as volunteers. Yeah. And um, Julie looks at me and says, well, we could do that. So we put our hands up and we're running this gem show for next year. Just a voluntary thing, right? Yeah. Anyway, talk about chaos. There's a bit of tension in the club between some of the older <laughs> members and the new president. Oh, yeah. And some really awkward stuff. Even when the president was telling us about it, and Julie just said, how old are these people? Yeah. We're talking about 80-year-olds acting like kids. Children. You know? Oh, my God. What are you going to do, right? Like, as you, as you, you know, move through into, you know, with each decade, you get a chance to reflect <laughs> upon the previous, right? Yes. And for me... I have found that there's traits that we're holding on to since the first decade of our lives and we don't lose them until we go. And well, it's, they just, well, it's they true. just stick around. Well, that's the thing. These people, if they have got chaos in their life, yeah. they will create further chaos where there's order. That's what I learned out of reading this. I've only read the first part of the book up to the lobster thing you know I've just finished the lobster story you know stand tall like a lobster <laughs> rule number one <clears throat> stand like a lobster hey you have to explain it to me is that a bit dark or you man this is the whole a bit more this is the whole point the whole point is is to be compl oh okay I'm just doing the sound on that but, but um, it allows me to know that things are still happening if I can see it as well yeah but the lighting here is great but this is so this is supposed to be relatable to the general person who really has very limited if any trust in professionally looking self-help blah 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 it is to be the most B grade thing ever. And it's the most what? B grade. Yeah. <laughs> deliberately. Yeah, deliberately. Because I don't want the context to overshadow the content. Yeah. And also 100% relatable. Yeah. 100% not anything real me. I'm just part of the process. Mm -hmm. And 100% in the moment. Yep. So if we're struggling in the moment, oh, people can know that. If we're kicking ass in the moment, See? Yeah. yeah, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I didn't want to go out of my way to make this really awesome looking professional production mm. type thing. I don't really care about that. Like that image, um, imagery doesn't really, yeah, I just, I'm not, I'm not fascinated by that anymore. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting um, enough feeling. It's hard to explain, that's for sure. Um, I got a great idea from you, but because we had the circle and I've been listening to people like um, Goonbelow and Lilu Mace, I don't like know, who? and Lilu Mace, I don't know if you're familiar no, with her. No. Well, she, she interviews Goonbelow here and there, and so I started following her stuff on, um, on YouTube. Yeah. And she goes up to Hawaii. Yeah. Um, and interviews this guy called Michael King, or Mikhail. Who's like a half Hawaiian, Japanese, Polynesian. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he starts talking about ceremony practices, and I'm going, yeah, this is the bomb. i got to keep that process happening. So yes. I acquired my sound bowl a little while ago. Oh, that's right. You mentioned that. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm like, well, he's like, if you're going to impart wisdom or anything like that, you've got to offer the respects to the forefathers, the ancestors. And I thought, 
Oh my god, this is great. This is, I've been asking for this for a little while. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize it. Um, yeah, so I got that from you, um, which I love actually. So you like the way we sort of have the sort of acknowledgement and then yeah sort of, man yeah. Like the acknowledgements are must yeah. and i think like i can't remember the guy's name but the guy who was sitting there and he was talking about the rites of passage yeah initiation sure sure yeah. so that that yeah. concept is missing i know 100 and you know yeah. through ways of doing this kind of thing you can actually prove it out oh and it's yeah. a form of initiation of what we're doing in Absolutely. the deeper conversations you have yeah, that's it. enables you to self-initiate not group initiate but you are actually in a group but you will process this any way you want that's it yeah that's 100 it so the idea for me is is to we're bringing up personal power <coughs> bringing up personal <coughs> vibration collective vibration and we're being ourselves hmm. that's the truth like we could you know just kind of like you had the four pillars yep you know to me, lean expression doesn't apply so much right now no. because I want you to be anything but lean yeah, expression. Yeah. I'm like happy for you to go for as yeah. long as you want. <clears throat> um, but otherwise, I love mm. that ethos. It mm. works for me so well um, and it's universal at the same time. But you can see when you've got a group and Richard was, you know, when he was uh, stuck on, we we're all focusing on him. He was stuck on trying to get something forward. Sure. And there was a moment when I was thinking, he needs to now relinquish what he's trying to say, yep. but he held on to it. Yep. We didn't interrupt him, sure. but it was his awareness that he had he'd exhausted this conversation, okay. and he didn't know when to finish. Yeah, that's a skill. It takes I had to learn that yeah. the last two years. I mean, the lean, be lean on expression. I was never lean. Sure, and. We're probably gonna fight. You know, us talkers are probably gonna fight that to the death, right? Well, we haven't had a problem no. with the group so far. Oh, I just mean on the individual level. It's gonna be our own internal yeah, thing. I think we'll, we'll be con we'll be thinking about it ourselves more oh, so yeah. than anyone else. You know, I, I learned to be a good listener. Yeah, yeah. And that's hard practice in itself. And mm. even the other thing I learned, which we haven't talked about, is mm. space. Where there's nothing being spoken. Sure, yeah. That's pretty powerful in itself. That's actually my focus when people do speak, is to look for the space when they're speaking and in between as well, mm -hmm. which is why I didn't say a lot and like try to go in. I was actually more like, I want to see all you guys do your thing because there's potential that you need it more than I do and I'm going to respect that even if it's not true. And you know, yeah. from a musical sense, there's. Uh, Absolutely. There's a thing saying yeah. it's it's not yeah. when you're playing it's yeah. what you're not doing. Yeah. The intervals between the yeah. spaces. Yeah. Is all the nuances. Cleverness. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I've been uh, not secretly but secretly recording this since I set it up. Yeah. Because I can just edit whatever I want out. Yeah. <laughs> like this part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. But um. Yeah, I um I brought a bunch of crystals. I, I was at my friend Johnny's place last night. I'm like, dude, I can't get this thing rolling until I sit down with you and do it together. Mm -hmm. Because cataclys cataclysmically, things were happening in a way that that just feels like the right thing to do. So I went over. He made us some food. We um, we got to chat, and I was like, look, I wanna. I've got my bowl here. I wanna do a bit of, of it with you. And I'm gonna try and you know give you some energy, pass some energy through to you as well. And did that and it rang out really well and I was like, man, this is sweet. And then we chatted for like an hour and forty or something and then you know, Sayonara. It was a really beautiful experience. So that's why I brought this bad boy along, but I'm feeling like the vibration here is so good already. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the the space is is just perfect. Um, but I was thinking, I want to light up a bit of Palo Santo. Would you be okay with that? What is that? Well, it is. It is this here. It's a little bit of incense. Well, it's a wood, really. Yeah. And whilst this is having its turn, yeah. I'd love for you to do the acknowledgement. Oh, yeah. Yeah? All right. 
Mm -hmm. Just give me the word and I'll let this bad boy out. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land that we are here gathered today. In particular, uh, those of the Juripal and the Yagara speaking nations of the Australian Aboriginal people of this land. And of course, our Torres Strait Islander people of this land who are up in the islands on the north of Australia. We'd like to pay respects to all elders and all elders past and present and emerging from all cultures, including our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters and families, because we're all one nation all together here on this land. But we do need to pay respects to the First Nations people. And that's really important. Absolutely. Um, it's their sacred space. We're here on stolen land, mm -hmm. um, but we now make it a home and they acknowledge that. So the acknowledgement is to acknowledge those traditional custodians for keeping this, uh, keeping this place for over 60,000 years scientifically. It's probably longer <laughs> uh, safe yeah. and, uh, and well. They didn't yeah. need us. They were doing just fine till you know we our ancestors arrived mm -hmm. uh, back in 1616 mm -hmm. up on the western coast of Australia with Dirk Hartog, the Dutch explorer who turned up that we very rarely talk about. Yeah. We all talk about Captain Cook, but the Dutch were here a long time. This was New Holland mm -hmm. in the European view, and Tasmania, my hometown, was Van Diemen's Land, where we didn't do anything good for the Aboriginal people of Tasmania or Van Diemen's Land, as you know. However, now, today, as we stand, the Aboriginal people uh, want a way forward to be recognised in our um, treaty, in our have a voice themselves, um, so that we can both live on this land together. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm. <laughs> so, there we go. Yeah, and that was... <laughs> That was uh, a new experience for me, yeah. Because as you're talking, and th thank you for that, by the way. Um, I'm getting these pictures yep. in my head about, you know, what it look might have looked like back in those times. Yes. Obviously, I've seen a few movies as well to help visualize that. But it, it's only since I've sort of been coming and hanging out with you guys that I've started to realize maybe looking at the legacy short and long medium terms yes. was like important to find that sort of space for which I've come through yes you know for my parents their parents etc etc I think the there. interesting thing is in Australia because remembering that they had existed they being the Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders mm. the two indigenous people of this land they had been quite comfortably here not building cathedrals and big monuments like the Egyptians or you know or the Jordanese or the Indians or you know the Chinese but yet if you think about those cultures of being five six thousand years old you know or Turkish you know eight thousand years old and we talk about a civilization that's been here scientifically meaning that that's as far that science can go to prove that they existed as a one existing race mm. 65,000 years you know is the scientific basis I did read that they have discovered 120,000 but that will take 10 more years to be scientifically uh, spoken about mm -hmm. they came across from Africa through the land bridge you know down through Papua New Guinea and you think about all those um, islands that they came through and the connections and then the land split and they were here isolated for such a long time. Um, and you know, they were doing very fine here. They had their own spiritual uh, beliefs through what they called the dreaming, you know, and they had their laws, spelled L-O-R-E. You know, they had over, I think it was something like 300 different nations with over, over 300 different languages. You know, you've got to, picture that, that an Aboriginal person up on the north of Australia was very different to someone down in uh, Tasmania. You know, they, they would never have come across each other. However, someone in what we now call Queensland would probably go even down as far as Victoria or New South Wales 
But each time they entered another nation's land, they had to get permission to enter through. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was all this ability to be able to negotiate. Uh, and I'm sure there were some where they wouldn't let them through for whatever, depending on their tribe or their story. Mm -hmm. um, and their whole story is where, when you meet an Aboriginal pe person today, their introduction is always um, where you're from, who's your mom. Really? Yep. So they identify uh, each other, even though you've got to imagine that a lot of the surnames of Aboriginal people mm -hmm. in the urban settings today you will find that they, when they say, oh, I'm, I am a, a Johnson, they go, oh, my brother married a Johnson, we must be related, and they start working it out. Mm -hmm. So when they first meet each other, this is to, that true of today, mm -hmm. they actually do a mind map of how and where you're from. So if you go back, they've been dislocated or disrupted for the last 200 years. So if your land was here in Brisbane, uh, which wasn't called Brisbane, but this was the banks of the Brisbane River. There would be one tribe on one side of the bank and another mob on the other side. But when colonists arrived here, they disrupted them. They took them and shifted them into missions. Like Sherberg, as an example, is a place that they took over a hundred different mobs and brought in there and tried to make them all live together. Yeah. And of course, you think about that, it's not as easy as that from a European point of view, they went, oh, well, they're all just natives and, mm. you know, they'll get they'll get on. But they all had different customs and yeah. different um, ceremonies. Sure. You know, it's not, it wasn't one fit, boomerang was not used by everyone. Yep. Didgeridoo was not used by everyone. Okay. And I think it's our lack of ignorance to think that that is how they fit. Even their dot painting only came through the 70s. It's not their traditional art. Traditional art, when you look at the artwork, is more the ochre in the hands mm -hmm. with the spraying of the hands, yep. you know, and ancient art was very different to what happened and, and took hold in the 70s mm -hmm. as what defined them, you know, being dot painting. Yeah, right. yeah so a lot of us don't realise and have the respect that they have a very different story to what we know about them. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you do realise that that disruption that the Aboriginal people have had um, caused by our ancestors trying to clear the land so that we could become an agricultural country to feed ourselves and feed, you know, back into England and back into Europe, the food that was grown here, the wool that was grown from the sheep, you know, the land was cleared for the cattle and, yep. the, and the sheep. Mm -hmm. And so we lost... The, the Aboriginal people lost their traditional um, lands, were pushed off them. Yeah. You know, they were actually chased off them, and if they didn't go, they, they were massacres. I mean, you know, yeah. massacres, and it, that's all coming out now, and it's not blaming anyone, it's just true of what was um, the domination of the Anglo Saxon and the colonial um, genetic makeup across the world. It happened yeah. in South, Amer uh, South America. With the Spanish, it happened in South Africa, with the uh, mining push in the in the you know 1800s. Mm -hmm. In Australia, a lot of it was to do with gold mining, as you know, and mining, mm -hmm. and pearl diving up in Broome and up in the Western Australia. Even in um, Torres Strait, it was all about pearl diving, and they learnt that as a trade, but it wasn't their natural thing that they were doing. <laughs> you know, and they learnt about how to make money, but they weren't paid well. Um, the lesson I learned in Brisbane, you go to the State Library here and you'll find out that there was a act in 1890 for the Aboriginal and Opium uh, policy. They used to pay the Aboriginal people with opium. So they would wow. basically get them stoned yeah. so that they would try to um, dislocate them mm -hmm. from being high. And it's true, you go into the library and you'll see the upstairs, there's 777 poppies in an art uh, commission work in a yep. big infinity um, thing up in the ceiling. Okay. There's a whole story about the opium wars. Um, it's fascinating. You didn't even realise that Aboriginal people in opium had an act by government. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of history we don't know. And I think, I won't go on about it, but sure. I think 
you know, the last two years I've had an amazing experience of learning and seeing what's really gone on and then you have a lot more respect rather than just a stereotype yeah. of how you see Australian uh, Aboriginal people. There's a lot of smart cookies out there now. Yeah. So the knowledge you that sort of shaped your more recent um, perspective came through that two year time or is that up and that really sort of I think it's come over a period of time yeah. and that just was sort of really condensing it into putting it in some order. You know, some sense. Yeah. So as as usual, if we look hard, I mean, not even that hard. If we just look, yeah, we can find it pretty relatively easy. Yeah. You know, all these other things about like global uh, climate change and politics and yeah. all the hidden plain sight, so to speak. Yes. So, yeah, Actually, right. I just read uh, Stan Grant. Okay. He's got a couple of good books out. Yeah. Uh, one's called My Country. Um, Aussie. Sorry. Aussie or. So he's an Aboriginal man. Yep. Um, his parents are, um, like back in his lineage, he's got Irish and he's got Aboriginal. Yeah. And he's had a real, now he's a journalist. He was a major journalist who went overseas and worked with CNN. Wow. But he works, I think he runs or is the chief editor of um, National Indigenous TV, which is called NITV, part of SBS. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Stan Grant's a very good thinker yeah. and a very good author. As I said, he's written a couple of books. He's, I went to one of his nights this year called Australia Day, where he he discusses about that really volatile discussion that comes up at the moment uh, around 26 of January. And depending on your view, when you peel back the history of that January 26, it isn't necessarily the date um, that you think in terms of that's when Captain Cook landed, etc. It's actually a date in 1938 when the Aboriginal people went and complained in Sydney and actually had a protest about being recognised as basically human beings because they were classed as flora and fauna. They weren't even classed Real. as human beings. In and the they way. weren't classified as human beings until 1967. So that fight took literally years and years and years. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed in, in mainstream pubs. So we talk about apartheid in uh, South Africa. Uh, the South Africans learnt from Queensland about apartheid. And we don't talk about that in the open history. No. But these are very real. That's um, incredible. Yeah, I know. So, well, And I'm not trying to sound like a doll here. But I, sure, I, yeah. I can... When you meet really passionate Aboriginal people, mm. that's their struggle. They're trying to get us all to open our eyes and see what's happened to mm. them and they're not saying oh well you need to give us our land back because that's silly that's mm. they know that they have to walk in these two worlds sure that's the that's the answer part of this answer is how to swim across the river mm. avoid in the river so to give you an example there's a beautiful video on youtube called swimming the river mm. it was done up in the kimberleys to explain to the aboriginal people how to find a way across the river. But the river has dangerous currents. And when you enter the river, there are crocodiles as well as dangerous currents. Now one cro crocodile represents drugs and the other one represents alcohol. And those two capture Aboriginal people as they're crossing the river. Opium was part of that in the early days and then grog and then drugs. So the current is the welfare system that they get sucked into and their own um, self-responsibility and self-determination has to come from somehow untying that government connection that mm -hmm. they've had yeah. for 150 odd years. Yeah. But we need to celebrate the successful part of their history. In 1850, there was a cricket team that was made up of Aboriginal people that used to go and compete in England. Sure. So there's been some of the greatest sports people that we don't even talk about. We know about, of course, you know, in the um, Commonwealth Games, a big part of the Olympics in 2000, was Cathy Freeman. Yep. But before that, in 1938, I think it was, in that time, there was a fast bowler who was the Aboriginal man who bowled out Sir Donald Bradman. His son became a world-class boxer. 
and in 1962 got the first gold medal as a boxer. Wow. Now, back on the $50 note, on the back of the $50 note, there's an Aboriginal man. Most people don't know who that is. Yeah. His name is David Unipin. Okay. David Unipin is another Leonardo da Vinci. And really? we never talk about it. What, what's actually, he? What? He invented stuff. Yeah, what was he up to? So he was inventing a whole lot of different stuff around um, around thermodynamics, I think it is, and all these right. different very, very strange stuff. So he, what happened though, because he wasn't educated in a university way, they stole the patents right. off him. They took him to England, they put him in a suit, the whole thing. He had the intelligence, a natural intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's on the $50 note. Hmm. But we forget, yeah. why is that man there and who is he? When you look at a $50 note, have a look, it's David Unipin. And yet, in our general day-to-day, -day, we don't celebrate that yep. they have some amazing stories like that. So, he got there because someone knew about him, obviously. Oh, yeah, definitely. But who is it that knows about him? And, um, Did you learn about him at school? Well, I've just learned about him now. <laughs> and I'm 36, man, so that answers that question. Well, don't worry, well, I've only just learned about him, yeah. you know. Well, these people who, who figured we're going to put this guy on the $50 note, yeah. like, what circles are they in? Well, the fact is, they realise that he <coughs> is up there as a genius. Yeah. He's up, but, but we've lost him historically. Um, well, where is his history kept then? Well, I, I would assume that it would be captured somewhere, whether it's in yeah, South okay. Australia or Victoria, wherever sure. he's captured. Yeah, okay. um, But there are so many pockets of that around. Like, you just got to look at the football teams. I think I was looking at 10% of all AFL players mm. are now of Aboriginal descent. And that's a big number when you think about 3% of the population identifies Aboriginal in Australia. Oh, right. And that number is around 600,000 mm -hmm. in, a, in a country that's got 25 million people. Yeah. And yet, in our prisons, particularly in our youth prisons, 50% mm -hmm. of all inmates in prisons are of Aboriginal identification. 50%. Yeah. Yeah. And not because of them, it's still because that harshness of um, the way we interact and the way they interact um, doesn't fit the sort of European yeah. model. Yeah, it, it's interesting because there's two models for living, shall we say, and then they collide. Like, if someone came and just smacked me over the face and I was injured and I needed to go to the hospital, it might take me some time to be okay with that person again mm. and it almost seems like you know you know my dad my parents are from British origin yeah you know not bringing Sri Lanka it was quite British in those days for my yes. um, but it almost seems like they're wanting them to have that forgotten in order to just keep coexisting and it's like obviously we live in a pretty amazing place you know like the way things have been developed and all the rest of it but it almost seems like okay well that was a couple of years ago just forget about that stuff. You know, but on, on one end, there's still the prejudice, and on the other end, there's still the feeling of the travesty and the ongoing cycles that come with. So the deepest thing with, say, your parents, if they were British but yet had a Sri Lankan, yeah. at some point, they let go of their old traditions and customs, sure. and they assimilated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The challenge yeah. with our Aboriginal uh, brothers and sisters yeah. is that this was their land before we arrived, yeah. so why would they try to assimilate to us yeah, that's a dominant totally right. race yeah. whereas we the way the way through healing mm -hmm. like for the two um different you know it's funny when we talk about jordan peterson mm -hmm. and he talks about order and chaos yeah if you think about what occurred there if we just go into sure. that context mm -hmm. that they had order and their order was the way they were doing things for such a long long time beyond the comprehension of our own like 60,000 years in our global history is a long time yeah i mean you know like the great dynasties of china were only 5,000 years old and we know that egypt they predict is only five to eight maybe ten thousand at the most we're talking 60,000 years of yeah. lineages and then we come along and we create absolute chaos you know, so from order to chaos, they had to try to rationalise that. And of course, in the view of the Englishman or the Dutch, they had order, but their order 
in the Aboriginal perception was pure chaos. And for the European and British, they looked at the Aboriginal people and just saw chaos, whereas they thought they had order. So they wanted to uh, instill civility, you know, and civilization as an order onto an, uh, onto an existing order. And there, that's where I think when you, yeah. Jordan Peterson talks about the yin and the yang, yeah. that the masculine is the order and the chaos is the feminine. And in the middle are the two dots, and that's the balance of harmony that gets the true balance of when the, you know, the yin and the yang are in full balance, right? Mm. So um, the healing that I think we've got to help and encourage between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and everyone else here, because it's not just Europeans now. Of course, we have over 213 different nations that have arrived on this land in the last 220 years. And more recently, you know, it started with the Greeks and the Chinese and the Vietnamese and now we've got the Sudanese and the Somalians and the the Syrians and, you know, and Indians and Koreans and we are a mishmash. So when you stop and say, what is it to be Australian? Really, until we reconcile that we're part of a longer story. This is what Stan Grant was saying. Once we accept that we're part of their story, 60,000 years or more on this land and that our story needs to merge with their story. So Australia Day for us as in the broader Europeans and multicultural, celebrated as a day to celebrate our nation. Mm. For them, it's Invasion Day because it's the day they got disrupted from the chaos and their order. That's why they'll never be happy that that should be the day. Mm. But Stan Grant, the author and journalist, he says as one idea that we need to find how to reconcile it because Moving the date won't help us either. No. Because there are four other dates that we can choose and we're actually going to upset, Mm. you know, the other two, Mm. uh, 23 million whatever people based on the 600,000. We've got to find a way where we can share that story and find a common ground. Mm. That's the only way we can find true reconciliation and healing. But everyone's got to understand the story before we can allow that. And there, there's the complex that we need to tell those stories mm. about David Unipan yeah. and Kathy Freeman, yeah. you know, and all the, the great people that they've had and yeah. have and yeah. still have today. Adam Goods, and look at the undertone of the racism around the footballer Adam Goods. Sure. I mean, he's Australian of the year, yeah. and yet they boot him off. I mean, that's disgusting that yeah. we treat our yeah. true Australians like that. Yeah, like I'm not going to condone it, but I'm, the having of someone being booed off happens. Yeah. Regardless of what they look no. like. And I, I mean, it's pretty easy for us to sit here and say that was pri- the primary context for people to do that. And I'm mean, like, he knows what, what he's up for, I would hope, when he's get, setting a foot into that arena to play a game, right? And to me, in, in another, you know, toss of the coin, I'm almost like laughing because I'm like, you people do him. He's one, you're many. Look what he's doing. Have some courage to be more like him, you know. And so that just highlights, you know, the sheer courage, bravery, all the rest of it. I get it. It's not nice. It, it, it's downright disrespectful. Um, but I, I don't think I'm going to put a people on a pedestal because of a travesty way back when I might um, what's the word elevate you know I might get really excited about something because of what they've achieved as an individual as well whilst being utterly respectful to all the other achievements that come through being in the collective and things like that because I love um, that book the four agreements where it's like if you get a negative comment or whatever you will try not to take it to heart but simultaneously yeah don't take it personally yeah Yeah. if you get a really high compliment yes 
treated in the same sort of manner. Yes. And I'm like, holy crap, man, that really yes. sort of demystifies your egoic nature. And if you can get, well, I'm awesome now because he or she said I'm awesome. And it's like, you actually need to remember that's just their view. Mm. And it is good that they have it, or sometimes it doesn't feel good that they have it, but you need to remain somewhat humble um, in order to continue to keep moving. So for me personally, I don't know about anyone else. Sometimes you get a good a good comment and you stop trying. You stop putting in work. <laughs> you become apathetic. Interesting, isn't yeah. it? Um, Yuval Noah Harari, you know, wrote a series of three books, The Sapiens, which was about yeah. our history. Yep. Um, Homo Juice, which is about Homo Deus. Deus? Juice? Juice. Yeah, right. D E U S, not Juice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> juice is pretty good. <laughs> uh, which is about Homo uh, meaning in Latin man and Deus meaning in Latin God. Okay. So that's what that book's about. But it's about the future. Mm -hmm. the possibility of what's going to happen in the infotech and biotech world. Mm -hmm. And then his latest one, which is called 21 Lessons um, for the Future, yeah. um, which is about the present. It's about today in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, that's what it's called. Yeah, that's cool. But I was just thinking about um, what you said about um, Adam Goods and um, not taking it personally. and. The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruz, yeah. well, the Fifth Agreement too, all yeah. of those yep. five agreements are powerful. And uh, that's what I find with um, Jordan Peterson. You know, these 12 rules, yep. I'm only up to rule two, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, <clears throat> I'm getting it. And, you know, he, he's, it's a powerful book. There's a lot of people... And I get it that they're not really on the same page with Jordan, but I think that's what makes him good, that you don't have to agree with him. Sure. He doesn't want you to yeah. worship him. He yeah. wants you to think. Yeah. He provokes your thinking. Yeah. Because both for me, Yuval Noah Harari and Jordan Peterson, these are people that we need right now mm -hmm. to make us think about where the hell we're going yeah. with humanity. Yeah. I've got a big enough, broad enough picture Yes, Yuval is, uh, you know, an Israeli man living in Israel, but he is a professor, and he is a professor of history, and equally with Jordan Peterson, you know, being a professor in psychology and psychoanalysis, but he's a broader piece of work. He's a polymath across a whole range of areas, yeah, yeah. mythology and religion and, you know, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And if you overlay those works with... Professor Joseph Campbell's work, I mean, and Don Miguel Ruse, I mean, all of a sudden you're capturing some real solid wisdom there. It does you know? seem to me that they're speaking in different languages, albeit, uh, you know, phonetically speaking, it's the same English. Yes. But I mean, it does seem to come from the same place. Yes. And I, like, for me, I'm like, I, I noticed the Christians have got some good stuff, the Jews have got some good stuff. Um, the, Islamic mean, people have got some good stuff. Yep. The atheists have got some good stuff. Yep. So the Hindus well. have got great stuff. Oh my! Like, you Hindus. all sound the same to me. Yeah. That I don't want to make it, you know, dumb it down or anything. No. But it does actually. I'm like, you guys really kind of have the same core. Yeah. And absolutely. I hope I don't offend anyone by saying that. Because. <laughs> oh <laughs> because, no. You know no, no, I mean? no! 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 Why should anyone? <laughs> but, the only person yeah. who would be. This is what Jordan Peterson says. The problem we've got is. The ideas that <coughs> turn into ideologies. Yeah. The problem is the ideology. Yeah, if someone's yeah, yeah. stuck in one of those mm. silos, mm -hmm. I'm Jewish, and therefore my uh, my three hundred and uh, I forget the exact number, but it's three hundred and eighteen different uh, uh, commandments that I live by. Yeah. If I'm going to be strictly Jewish, yeah. or if I'm uh, you know, I'm a Christian, then I've got ten commandments that I live by. But how many Christians do you know that would really live by those commandments? They're not rules, sure. they're commanding you. Okay. Commanding you to live by that mm -hmm. if you're going to take it and run that Seriously. ideology. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, um, the truth is, they're all being based on the, the cultural identity of people within a certain framework. Like, you know, Christianity was good for a period of history um, and a period of time, as was 
Um, the Islamic thought um, has been good for the predominance of Arabic um, countries at a particular time. What do you, what do you mean by that? Like, I'll clarify it just because some people might be like, is that still good? They want to know maybe what do you mean by it was good for a particular time? Right? So, I think historically it was what people found their belonging and identity with. Okay. And so when you... From outside the circle or already in a... So you became part of that circle. Yeah, so okay. if I knew that everyone in my neighbourhood is Christian, yeah. Yeah. even though they may be uh, a slightly different persuasion, whether sure. it's Catholic or Anglican, yeah. traditionally they all believe in Jesus Christ, sure. right? Yeah. So therefore, that's the commonality. Mm. But when you add comes back to Jordan Peterson, when you add another idea, yep. so Christianity and Catholicism, yep. um, mind you, they have created strife, that order and chaos, sure, yeah. like, you know, take Ireland, for example, with the Irish and the Protestants, you know, no different to the Sunnis and the Shias in um, Islam, okay. you know, where they have a, 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 a grievance with each other. Yep. Let's say, forget the Shiites for the moment, but the Sunnis, who are the majority, but if our whole neighbourhood are all Muslim, we know that we all sort of are very similar to each other. Yeah, okay. And then next door to you, in moves a Christian family. Mm -hmm. Well, your ideology and this ideology is like order and chaos. Yeah, okay. Depending on which one you sure. are, yeah. you see the other one yeah. as not ordered because yeah. you see your ideology as the chosen one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And pick any of those religions yeah. They all have that same idea, you know, particularly uh, Judaism, which is a, a smaller number religion, like there's only um, something like 15 million uh, Jewish people in the world, okay. whereas with Christians there's 1.2 million, a uh, billion, yeah, right. you know, Islam there's 1.2 billion, but Jewish people really believe uh, that they are the chosen ones, mm. and so do Christians believe that they are the chosen ones yeah. and so do Islam yeah. and yet they're all part of the what we call the Abrahamic yeah. um, triad yeah. you know there's three Abraham religions there's actually four the Baha'i right. faith Baha'i faith is came out of Persia which yeah. was Iran um, and Iraq so who are, who are they exactly and what are they so Baha'i faith came out through the 1800s mm -hmm. 19th century um, with a particular belief around unity, mm. unity uh, across all religions. Um, they, they really do embrace cultural diversity. Yep. Um, they, it's funny because at the end of the day they are a religion mm. and even though, for example, in Australia they say they don't have a temple or a place of worship, their place of worship is in lounge rooms uh, of people that hold a gathering, you know, a scripture gathering around um, their lounge room. So they'll invite people over. That's their church, you know. But in actual fact, all the money goes back to a very big temple back in, uh, in the Middle East that is the Baha'i Faith's major big um, cathedral. And I'm not sure if it's a cathedral or a synagogue, but it yeah, is a, yeah. a major temple. Wow. Yeah. Is that still in existence now? Oh, yeah. Baha'i, we went to dinner with um, a Baha'i family. Beautiful family, by the way. Um, yeah. Persian. Yeah. They call themselves Persian. Like that's Iran, Iraq. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they call themselves Persians. Um, but they invite anyone. And a lot of it's around music and uh, stuff. But one of their, when you read their sort of ethos. Yeah one of the things that uh, I was a bit unsure of, I'm not judging sure. it, but it was, they really believe in a new world order. Yeah, okay, in the one that you, you know that I know about, or? Well, that's the thing. I don't know if we're talking about the same new world sure. order, which is one government. That's what they're talking about, a one world government. Yeah. I struggle with that whole concept. Was there a combo you guys were able to have? No, we didn't talk about that. Okay. They were just trying to recruit us to their religion. Naturally. But I respect people choosing whichever yeah. flavour they want to do. Yeah. So I'm not down on any religion. Sure. It's part of human... Mm -hmm. uh, people want to believe something. And yeah. 
it helps them clarify their identity sure. and their belonging. Mm. It's a tribal thing, you know. Mm. Uh, I mean, Australia, they said, was built on um, a Christian country. No, that's because the people that came here already had that instilled in them mm -hmm. from their homelands. It yeah. was never here. Sure. Aboriginal people had dreaming. Like, if we yeah. really wanted to get pull this down, yeah. you know, there was already a spiritual ceremony and yep. sacredness around this land. We bought, uh, or our ancestors bought in an existing idea. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's the clashing of these ideas. You know, when these people get upset about, oh, we've got so many Muslims here, da, da, da. It comes back to order and chaos. Yeah. And perception. Yeah, well, they're perfectly mm. fine. Mm. And people say, oh, but they should be more like us. They need to assimilate. Yeah. No, see, that's one person dominating another, trying to say that ours is a perfect way and therefore yours isn't. And that's wrong. We've got to find a way to both well, do you say, live together, you know? Would you say it's more, instead of like, when you, because domination to me insinuates that we're going to have to throw out your, your inner things and you're going to have to take on mine. Mm. So, you know, some people might want to do that, but oh. the, for those who don't... I'll tell you a story. Yeah. I'll tell you a little story. Well, I mean, is there a better way in the sense of I'm going to respect where I'm going and I'm going to partake in living in a situation where I will consciously respect my moving into another place and hopefully we can dwell together in a way that I'm em you're showing empathy somewhat and I'd like that in, in return. I don't know if that's... In a perfect world, that'd be ideal. Yeah. Like, I think for a country like Australia that's not unlike Canada or New Zealand, sure. we are the multicultural or intercultural experiments, right? Yeah. You know, you think across the world, um, even America uh, isn't as intercultural to a large degree in the pockets of, I mean, New York probably is. It's got a central gravitation to mm -hmm. a lot of cultures because the United Nations Centre is there, etc. When you go out to all the regions and the other cities, yeah. they're very, um, yeah, they're broken up with African American, Hispanic, um, and um, you know, European. Mm. Um, they might have some Indian and some thing, but they're not broadly uh, as diverse as, say, Australia. Okay. Cool. Now, I could be I wrong in the stats, but yeah. no, no, but you go over there, and w I think we have a lot more Asian influence here because we're down in the Asia Pacific. You know, Australia's oh. down in the southern. Um, yeah, the hemisphere. I'd say there's a, a lot of Asian. Pacific. Yeah, no, well, that's why India and Australia, India, that, China, yeah. and 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 this part of the world, mm. we are all very close to each other. And then, of course, you've got the Melanesians and the Polynesians and the Micronesians. Jeez, you you just know, said Melanesians. Two that I don't even know about Melanesians and Micronesians. No. So, Micronesia, um, Micronesia is your. Um, Papua New Guinea. Okay. Melanesians are your um, even Torres Strait Islanders and your what they called South Sea Islanders. Yep. Um, taking in Vanuatu, Cook Islands, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then Polynesian is the broader one of Maori, Tongan, Samoan. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course Tahitian and Polynesian are very close, like the Hawaiians. Yeah. Um, and even when you go to Peru. Uh, we went to a place called uh, Lake Titicaca. Oh, have you been there? Yeah, we wow, went to Lake Titicaca. That's awesome. Now that, for anyone uh, who doesn't know, it's 14,000 feet above sea level. 14,000? Yeah. That's incredible. Um, which is mighty high. And they have this lake where for 